Line with us is the Reverend William Barber, the president and senior lecturer at Repairers of the Breach, the co-chair of the Poor People's Cam Campaign, the pastor at the Greenleaf Christian Church in North Carolina, and the architect of the Forward Together Moral Movement. BreachRepairers.org is the website. Rev. Dr. Barber, R-E-V-D-R-B-A-R-B-E-R -E -E is his Twitter handle, um, or B Repairers. Uh, Dr. Barber, welcome back to the program. It's so great to have you with us again. Last week you were going to be with us, but you were getting arrested. You want to tell us about what's going on? Well, surely. And thank you so much, Tom, for having us today. I also want to talk some about what you were just talking about, the hidden history of the Supreme Court. Because we were getting arrested last week with um, Planned Parenthood Center for Democracy. Uh, because we believe we need both uh, action in the street, action in the ballot box, and action uh, in the legislative suites. And really making the connection between the Supreme Court uh, gutting the rights of women's productive rights, uh, gutting voting rights, uh, gutting labor rights, and then making treating corporations like people and people like things. And so we all joined together to say that we won't go back uh, we are going to use the model of both protest and voter participation in massive ways. Uh, and I was honored to stand with the leadership of Planned Parenthood to say that any time a legislative person, a congressperson, or a Supreme Court justice gets up in the morning and says, I'm not going to use my power to expand health care to a universal even though 330,000 people died during uh, the pandemic because we didn't provide universal health care. I'm not going to pass living wages so that people can have a life, a decent life, and be able to stand the buff against the buffers of, uh, of inflation. Uh, and I'm not going to expand voting rights and protect them. But what I will use my power for is to take the reproductive rights of a woman, uh, give death and rapists and incest more power over a woman than she has uh, and threaten to take the rights of the LGBTQ community and others uh, and fundamentally violate the 14th Amendment that the Supreme Court and legislators and Congress people swear to uphold. That is not a use of power. It is an abuse of power. I brilliantly said, so brilliantly said. Um, you, you are... Uh, challenged by a, a pretty severe and crippling form of arthritis, you, uh, you, and and I'm and I'm wondering, you know, how do you stay inspired and keep up the fight in the face of not just the physical challenges that you're facing, but also the, you know, just the overwhelming, uh, you know, uh, how does the average person, for that matter, you know, what advice do you have for people about staying inspired and staying in the fight in the face of? Uh, what seems sometimes to be overwhelming odds or all the personal challenges that, that we all have in our lives? Well, you have to remember the sides of history where against overwhelming odds, people fought back. I mean, let's go back to the book you were just discussing. Let's realize that this country started out with an intentionality about allowing the rich to control everything. It's not as though it's new. Uh, poor white people, could, men couldn't even vote uh, when the Constitution was original pen. Native people, women, and African Americans, people had to fight through that, even though it was overwhelming. Uh, let's go to Frederick Douglass in 1852 when the Tanning Court passed the Dred Scott decision. And Frederick Douglass gives this powerful speech a few months later saying that everything is against us, the magistrates, the Congress, the, the Supreme Court. And he says, but... Uh, there's a higher court than the Supreme Court. And if, he says, I received this monstrous decision cheerfully because I know that the people ultimately will not stand for it. And every attempt to ally uh, the abolitionist movement has only served to intensify and embolden this agitation. And so instead of backing down, they stood up and they built and they continued to fight. Every leader that I have read about, I spent a lot of time reading autobiographies, uh, had some major, you know, challenges and disabilities. Abraham Lincoln had it in his family and personally. Uh, President Roosevelt had polio and could hardly walk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. King was stabbed early on, way before he ever did die, have a dream speech. In the Bible that I read, the, many of the prophets suffered and struggled. Um, and so I try to look to them. 
And then I'm inspired by the people. You know, I, I'm inspired by people who fight every day in this country, poor and low wealth people, people without health care. And they're the greatest moral leaders in this country because somehow they keep getting up and believing that they can, that fundamentally things can be changed. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, suffered greatly, but she never backed down. So we don't have the option of backing down. Do, are days tired sometimes? Sure. Uh, do we get hurt sometimes? Sure. Are we upset sometimes? Sure. Are we angry sometimes? Sure. But there's a sense in which if you are alive when un injustice is trying to take over everything, then maybe you were born for that moment. Maybe you were born to be a part of the many who decide that we're not going to go back, we're not going to take this standing down, and that we're going to join the, the, the great uh, uh, um, you know, hallmark and hall of fame and chorus of people down through the years who have chosen to fight. One of my great scriptures in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, and it says, we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but mm -hmm. we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of not have evidence of, of things not seen. And then lastly, Tom, sometimes in the midst of the push, we forget our power. You know, if people are fighting to suppress the vote, that must mean we have power that we didn't have that they're afraid of. If people are trying to block labor, then labor must be a powerful force. So many times Howard Thurman said, you must learn your own power from the way that your adversary pushes against you. And so I'm hopeful, even in these desperate times, because right now, for instance, poor low wealth people make up 33% of the electorate, 45% in battleground states. In the Poor People's Campaign, National Call for Moral Revival and Repairs of the Breach, we understand that much of what we see are extremists trying to hold on. It's kind of like they did in South Africa, the last throes of apartheid, because they see a demographic shift, both in color, in character, and in content, that they're not going to be able to hold back for so long that they know if we come together, poor and low wealth people all over this country, I think in 15 states, for instance, if poor and low wealth people vote anywhere between 1% and 26% higher than they did the last few elections, and these are people that are already registered to vote, they could fundamentally decide who, who sits in the presidency, in the governor's house, a mansion, in the state legislature, and the Congress. The adversarial extremists know this. That's why they're fighting so hard to grab so much now. But we're not through our long shot, and we've got work to do. Tell us about the breach repairers and the Poor People's Campaign and how the people who are watching or listening right now can participate with the work that you're doing, Reverend Barber. Well, I want everybody to go to uh, www.breachrepairs.org or www.poorpeoplescampaign. Uh, and you can uh, do hashtag Unite the Poor or hashtag Poor People's Campaign. You know, June 18th, Tom, uh, we had the largest gathering of poor and low wealth people, religious leaders, economists, and others in the history of the country around five interlocking injustices, uh, uh, po uh, racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. Tens of thousands of people and millions online joined together to say we stand against those. And we heard from people that you don't normally see together. Normally, when you have a national gathering, you see people speak on behalf of people. But instead, we had white women from West Virginia standing with black women from Alabama, from the Appalachia to the Delta. We had undocumented workers from California standing together with fast food workers and farmers from Carolina and farmers from Kansas. Building this coalition and committed, they filled the streets from Third Street all the way down to uh, 14th Street in, in, uh, in, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And we made a commitment, a seven point commitment. We're calling for a major White House summit on poverty because we can't continue to ignore 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. That's 43% of the nation and 52% of our children. We're massively organizing the vote uh, in 15 to 20 states across this country for this midterm. We refuse to believe the midterm has to be small and a small turnout. We're uniting and hooking up and saying to folk, listen, the same people attacking women's reproductive rights are the same ones attacking voting rights, are the same ones attacking living wages. And if they are uh, cynical enough to be together, we must be smart enough and strategic enough to come together. 
You know, we had massive religious bodies that in recent years had not come together in the streets like this. And so June 18th, the mass poor people's low-wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington was not a day, but a declaration and not a commencement, but a commencing uh, of what we're going to continue to build. And what we're saying to America is the, the key to, to changing the Congress so that even if extremists are there, they're in the minority. The key to changing state legislators so that even if extremists are there, they're in the minority. The key to electing people so we can get a better Supreme Court lies in the hands of poor and low wealth people. Mm. And any political party that is not focused on lifting up and dealing with the issue of poverty and low wealth is not focused on mobilizing poor and low wealth people who represent 33% of the electorate is is what I call constitution engaging in a politics that is constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, politically inept, and economically insane. The bill, the, the very stones that have been rejected, people without health care, people live, making less than a living wage, uh, people affected by climate change the most, they are the very people that hold the power key, the political power key, to challenge the greedy aristocracy in this nation. And we must mobilize this sleeping giant. It is waking up, and we intend to wake it all the way up. That is absolutely marvelous. You are you are truly one of my heroes, Reverend Barber, and, I, and I'm a big supporter of your work and um, strongly encourage people to check out breachrepairs.org and poorpeoplescampaign.org. Reverend Barber, thank you so much for dropping by today. Thank you, Tom. Glad to be with you. It's always an honor to have you on this program.